Okay, uh, my gana, you called it now, guys. It would, it would have been the whole video. So I'll just cut the beginning part. Okay. So, da da da, kita na morning slide na ma urbanize ang Cebu. Uh, traffic problems, economics, axioms. So, we'll just go to the axiom part. So far, it makes sense that prices change depending on the location. And then, oh, excuse me, also depending on the location, you might have self-reinforcing self effects that create um, quote-unquote extreme outcomes. So uh, my example was pollution and also like uh, the, the sort of agglomeration are coming together businesses and then the externalities cause inefficiency. This is just a fancy way of saying that when you buy something, there are factors that are not included in the cost of buying that object. So a t-shirt, a car. And for a t-shirt, the externality is the pollution it generates when you create the shirt. For the car, it's also the pollution, but also you generate congestion when you use the car and you drive it around. Next, production is subject to scale economy. So this uh, graph shows that the higher, what do you call this? The first price here is P1. Small firm has higher average cost, while increasing the output leads to lowering the average cost. So if you have uh, quantity here, two, and then because of the amount of quant the quantity of like goods you're producing, eventually the cost of kanang actually making that good lowers because you become more efficient in making that particular good. So my example here would be a fast food chain. So in fast food, they created a system where they reduce costs from like the cooking, the, the coming together of ingredients, and then it becomes profitable for them to expand, provide more sort of their fast food uh, services, and then it will reach a point where they can basically can, um, keep on expanding, but it flattens out here at the end. So there's an amount of quantity and prices that keeps them from expanding further, but as long as they don't hit the sort of the end of the end of the curve here, they will keep on expanding. So there's like a what we call in urban planning a carrying capacity for these kinds of businesses. But the idea is that once a business becomes more efficient and producing whatever they're producing, they would sort of expand and increase their kind of production because it's cheaper for them to do so. Okay, I'll just reduce that back. And then finally, I don't have an, uh, I thought I had an image for this. So Katosha, zero economic profit is a bit tricky because it means um, normal accounting profit, meaning no loss or no gain. I think I'll have a slide here. I'll discuss it when I find it. Hmm. Okay, I can't find it. <laughs> just like, just put the axiom five like in the back of your mind. So I will discuss it when we get to it. So why do cities exist? Um, just like in the general, it's because of agricultural surplus. Um, by the time the cities industrialized, this was the 1800s. There were more people. Uh, farming became so efficient that there were more people who were free to do other things like study, um, create their own business. There's also urban production where uh, comparative advantage was gained through e economies of scale. So basically it became cheaper to produce more goods. So we became kind of more urbanized. So that's also a example of a reinforcing effect that would lead to extreme outcomes. So the extreme outcome is urbanization. And the reinforcing effect is that producing goods and services eventually becomes kind of cheaper and then more profitable for business owners. And then transportation also became better because transportation, uh, because through transportation, we can facilitate more exchange of products, more buying, selling, etc. So here we go. So economies of scale, uh, the cost advantages that, fir that firms obtain, uh, basically the reduction of cost per unit of output. 
So this economies of scale here, I'll just like I just took it from a YouTube video, means that the long run average cost, basically the long term cost of that production, because of what they call the economies of scale, it becomes cheaper to produce more. And then eventually, you would reach a point what what they call a constant returns to scale, where the uh, regardless of how much of a product or service you provide, it will not reduce the cost of the what they call this of the good or services. No matter how much Jollibee expands, their profit remains the same. And then if they expand too much, the costs increase again. So it reaches that there's that like sweet spot or equilibrium point where firms want to grow and then just stop growing like a limit okay so this we kind of see this in the history of cebu city as well like uh from an economic perspective from the 1500s to the 1800s cebu city was a trade city for the spanish and became an industrial city during the american occupation and then an innovation city basically uh, talking about uh services bpo which is what we're experiencing today. So tourism and business process outsourcing. So for those in the previous class, we saw this Cebu City, an area of uh, 315 square kilometers and a population of currently 960,000 people. Oh, sorry. And then we saw this in the previous slide. I think some of you, or I think all of you were in my previous class. You can see that economies of scale are happening in Cebu City because it's cheaper for us to or like it's more viable for developers to develop new subdivisions in our uplands because it's more expensive here in the sort of urban core we have urban sprawl so that's a sort of reinforcing effect that more people want housing and therefore developers want to develop more land and then that creates this the, the extreme outcome is urban sprawl. Okay, so this is just sort of a short graph or like table showing why cities exist and uh, talking about comparative advantage and lower opportunity costs. So in trading and factory cities, the key economic activity is the production of specific goods. So we're talking about um, Two cities here just imagine now in your head there's no drawings this is just very kind of very stale economics ideas there's two cities one in the north and one in the south so uh the north city creates uh buy spread at minus two sort of uh dollars but sells t-shirts at plus six dollars and then the what they call this the south city creates bread uh, and then sells it for plus two dollars and then buy shirts for minus two dollars so north the north city gives four shirts for two loaves so basically they what they call this so that's plus six and then they the shirts are minus two so you sell what they call this <laughs> basically the the six dollars for the shirt becomes kind of uh, minus four over here and then the sort of two two port the the, the two dollars for the bread um becomes like uh it's minus two so they get plus two over here and this over here becomes minus two because they traded the bread and this is plus four for the shirts over here and then the gain from the trade is the North City basically gets $2 worth of shirts. And there is, um, they basically break even on the bread. And then the South City gets also an additional $2 worth of uh, sort of goods and services from the shirts. So basically, it's a win win situation. And then the zero here is the uh, net, or sorry, the zero accounting profit, which I mentioned earlier here. Uh, sorry. So basically, what this graph is trying to say that the trading between North and South cities gains them sort of $2 each, where instead, if they just created their own bread, they would have a sort of inefficiency or a deficit of minus $2 for the bread that they make. And then trading gives them sort of plus $2 worth of shirts. 
So far, so good. <laughs> I know I'm not explaining it well, but the idea is kanang trading between two cities will affect kanang will benefit them, and then this is why businesses tend to locate in specific cities, and they will have sort of specialties. So in Cebu, the specialty is kanang. Uh, commercial industries like business process outsourcing, retail. Meanwhile, in Mandawe, the specialty is industrialization. So um, the products produced in Mandawe can be bought by the people in Cebu and the jobs generated by the BPOs and the uh, retail services will encourage people from Mandawe to work in Cebu and then, then vice versa. So there are a lot of trading and trading benefits and um, cities and um what they call this based on what special specialty they have and then i just want to show you a sort of connecting our discussion earlier with the uh what they call national protected agricultural areas i think it's let me double check it's nn mud just want to check what n and DAAP is, there we go. Okay. Sorry, I'm derailing my own lecture. Da, 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 da. Sometimes I just really want to know the name. So the network of protected areas for agricultural and agro-industrial development. So the NPAAAD, the NPAD. And then you see the um these are the agricultural lands and then if you if you put it next to the soil map of the philippines you can actually find out that these lands are of the cambisols like uh order so if you notice um geography like the physical sort of attributes of a site will determine what kind of business and like a uh, uh, econ economics economic activity uh, what kind of economic activity will occur in that area? So that that's very kind of, oh, excuse me, Oof, had a big lunch. It's very obvious when you look at it this way, and it gets a bit complicated when we try to talk about it in economic terms. The idea for me, my suggestion would be to just break down the kind of sort of the economic jargon and try to simplify it into something that you can understand and relate to. So going back to why cities exist, it's because there are more people who can engage in businesses uh, that are that is like outside agriculture and they can do like education, they can do kind of small businesses, BPOs, etc. So people come together, they create sort of the urban core, and then you have several urban cores that are existing. Eventually they will trade with each other. And that creates our kind of urban environment today. And then talking about sort of market areas, which is our next topic. So what is a market area? So market area is sort of the distance or the area of kind of, uh, let's say a factory or a business is kind of gaining profit from. So the market area of the factory is the area over which it underprices the, the home production of shirts. So the example is t-shirt again. <laughs> so the idea is that, remember our examples from earlier now, that for a shirt company to make a profit, they need to deliver the shirts to their end users, their kind of, uh, consumers. So if you break it down uh, within an eight kilometer, uh, eight mile radius they can still attract customers without kind of, uh, losing money in transportation costs that becomes the market area of that particular in this in case uh, shirt factory so we have here um i don't know why he likes using bread so the price or cost in bread uh, is over your vertical axis your um, y axis and your x axis is the distance of factory miles. So they're basically again trading breads for shirts. So if they go all the way to the uh, eight mile mark, 
they will trade one shirt for one bread. So they're, they break even. Meanwhile, if they're within the eight mile mark, they can sort of, uh, what they call this? Uh, they can trade, like, how do I, how do I describe this? The net price of a factory shirt is a factory price. Uh, one th is the factory price, so net price. <laughs> one third equals uh, one third shirt equals four and a four twelfths of a loaf bread output. Uh, this is so it's too complicated. Uh, we'll just skip this. Go. Mm -hmm. But we just like. <laughs> We'll just ignore the math for now, but basically the idea is that there's a breaking even point where the goods they produce uh, no longer is profitable, so they stop like their distribution at that point. In this case, the eight miles, and then you'll have several factories of the same Kanang company locate eight miles from each other. So. This sort of connects with the fifth axiom that competition generates uh, quote unquote zero economic profit. So the zero point is here. And let me just take a circle over there. Fill, no fill. Okay, and let's make that a red circle. And I promise you it will become clear once I have the maps. I can't. Oh. I hate using economic jargon because I'm not an economist, but this is the math behind it. So at a certain point, they have a zero accounting profit, so they stop expanding there. That's why our example here is Kanang, a Apple store. So this is in the, I think, Apple New Haven. This is somewhere in the US, I think, um, Seattle or something like that. So in red here are the, kanang, it's the market area of one Apple store. And then if you sort of get this, let's see here. I'll make this circle again. have a similar looking circle. I think the circle is a bit too big. Shape fill, we'll just have it no fill. Make that bright green. Oops. I don't know why it's not cooperating. There you go. Like so. So the idea is that we see this in our physical environment where you have different stores locate certain distance, distances from each other. And this is because of the market area, um, basically factor. So we have Starbucks, you have several Starbucks in one area. And then their market area is, for example, this is about four blocks, maybe about like two kilometers. And you wouldn't see another Starbucks for two kilometers or maybe just one kilometer. But if you go outside of that mar market area, you see another Starbucks or coffee store. So how this develops cities is that businesses don't want to sort of cannibalize their target market. So they locate at certain dis distances. And that distance is determined by their profit margins. Where is their limit where they can still make a profit? And this sort of shapes how our cities can um, develop because if we look at Cebu City over here, so it's a, a lot more easier to understand if we have like visuals. Let's look at Ayala Center or let's look at our malls because there's a lot of malls in the Philippines. Let's see how far is Ayala Center Cebu. Oh, sorry. Clear measurement from Ayala IT Block. It's also an Ayala branch. So it's somewhere over here. So that's about 1.38 kilometers. We can sort of estimate based on our uh, 
just like a uh, rule of thumb that the market area would be half the distance between two similar um, businesses. So if the total distance is 1.38 kilometers, you could probably say that the market area of this Ayala Center Cebu would be around 500 kilometers, I meaning their immediate sort of consumer base is here. And then for Ayala IT Park, it's somewhere like this. But it's still very likely that people from outside their market area will still visit. So people from Talamban still go to Ayala Center Cebu. People from, I think, even as far as Salisay can still go to Ayala Center Cebu. But their main target market is really within this, uh, let's say, 500, 600 uh, square kilometer, uh, not square, 600 kilometer radius. So you see in uh, Ayala, a large a large kanang portion of the floor plan or the building is look, is dedicated to a kanang public market that's metro ayala cebu over here and i think this is really the space that caters to um, the 600 kilometer radius here because so this is more kanang middle to low income market and if you look at the area around ayala center cebu you see a lot of and uh, informal settlements, not really kind of all informal, but you can see some low income settlements and a bunch of kind of middle income settlements. So how that shapes a city is that it can be either the settlements come first or the Ayala comes first. And then how you will know which comes first is that you need to look at the history of the area. And then I think for the most part, um, I have my Google Earth here. My best guess is that Ayala came first. I think it was constructed in the 1990s. And by the so 1990s, I don't think this area is as was as kind of dense as it is today. So let me Google let's see, Ayala Cebu. Ayala Cebu. Search. Let's turn on the histogram. Okay, I'll go back as far as it will let me. Nineteen eighty-five. There's not really any images. Let's say two thousand eight. Look at that. So much green. So this is Ayala in the 2000s, and this is Ayala today. And I'll, I'll put them side by side so we can better compare. Oh, excuse me. I think I ate too much for lunch. It's causing some indigestion. OK. like so. So you can clearly see there's still a lot of vacant lots in like the 2000s compared to today in the, like let's say 2020s, like 20 years difference. I'll zoom out a bit so the scale is more similar. You can see this part here to the east of Ayala uh, where they have the Samar loop. There's a lot more vacant lots, which leads me to believe that Ayala came first, and then the sort of and, um, the residents came after, like towards Ayala. But I think the main target market of Ayala was really the people here in N. Escario, because it looks like just by looking at their houses, it looks like they have like a uh, more income than these uh, settlements over here, can in Kamputau River, but uh, with without maps from the 1980s kind of hard to tell or like uh, the actual history of ayala bro i would guess na ayala came first and then the subdivisions came later something like that so that's how what they call this businesses and economic development shape cities so the 
because we're coming at it from a business perspective like if the business is there the people will come nearby the business and also it's still likely that based on history that the businesses go after where the people are so uh let's see economic development already talked about this business finance marketing okay small businesses that's where you don't see the result so economic development objectives job is like job creation job retention tax base enhancement and in the, the improving of the quality of life at least for the developer side then economic development stakeholders of course the local government the state government federal government special authorities in charge of that particular area public private partnerships etc etc so we have the theories we already talked about this okay we talked about this and then efforts so this is more kind of u.s based history of economic development efforts i think we already talked about this uh, no this is new this will be for our next reading so it's four o'clock we're until 2 30 to 5 30. yeah i think that's correct so now i'll stop the recording here we will do our reading for the week